This is, I believe, the fifth interview with graduate students in the department. My guest is Robert Silvey. He, Hello. Yes, Robert Silvey. He is an applied math major, or I shouldn't say major because it's graduate school, but you're getting your degree in applied math, and the way I understand it is that you came in without a master's degree, and then in the process of getting your PhD, you, you got your master's degree. I know they have different uh, requirements to get a master's degree depending upon the university, so it's different in different places. So tell me about when you first got accepted. What were the conditions when you were accepted? Okay, um, so when I was first accepted into graduate school, uh, I was only, I had only applied for, for master's uh, programs. So I had so you initially, were... out of uh, graduating with my, my undergraduate in applied mathematics, after completing that, I had, at that point in time, only intended to complete a master's. Okay, did you get your bachelor's degree here or did I can't you? Hear, okay, yes. so you so you so okay, so you got your bachelor's at in applied mathematics. Yes. So, okay, so how does that differ from pure mathematics? Like what does cuz in pure math, I'll tell you this. At my university when I was initially getting my degree in math, I I didn't get my degree in math, but when I was there, if you do favor the they don't distinguish between the two. Mm -hmm. But from what I understand, pure math leans more into the modern algebra root, real variables, and then like maybe some non-Euclidean geometry is thrown in there somewhere. Mm -hmm. Just, But applied math tends to favor more like statistics, probability theory, maybe PDEs is a bigger deal. Um, are those the courses that you took? Did you take modern algebra or real variables? I took uh, real analysis in graduate school at the 50 level. Um, prior to that, though, uh, do you mean like when you when you ask the difference between uh, pure and applied math? Do you mean in general or more specifically to the the undergrad courses or at a graduate level? Uh, ju just the undergraduate courses. What did you take as an undergrad? From from an undergraduate level, I didn't even know pure math existed. It was just applied. <laughs> I, I was like, this is math. I'm doing applied math. It is math? Yeah. That was that was kind of my understanding and mindset from pretty much throughout my whole undergrad. It okay. wasn't until I was in graduate school that I took uh, real analysis. I believe I took that my first semester as a graduate student because that, that course is actually a, a prerequisite. Analysis one and two is a prereq to several of the traditional applied courses. Like what? Like numerical? Like numerical, like uh, statistics. Really? Yeah. So. Um, Analysis is technically a prerequisite to those courses, so I uh, I was allowed to take it simultaneously, and so that was my first semester as a graduate student was uh, taking the I was taking analysis. stats and real analysis at the same time. But and you were so, taking were you taking graduate level stats or it was undergrad? forty fifty level? Oh, oh undergrad, okay, okay, undergrad, yeah. So that was so was your first year here the same as mine, or were you here before me? Uh, twenty eighteen. 20, 2018 fall was my first semester. As a grad student? No. No, no, no. Oh, as an undergrad. As an undergraduate student. As a grad student, uh, that would have been fall 2021 then. Okay, so that was the same semester that I came in. Okay. So, so you came in, and you were just going to get your master's degree. Yeah. In, in mathematics. So they made you take the undergraduate real analysis course. Mm-hmm. Uh, because it was a prerequisite for the numerical analysis course that you wanted to take? Yeah, for, for pretty much all of the, I think like uh, almost all of the graduate courses. That Needed a real analysis. Yeah. Okay. So, but you took the, uh, qu your qualifying exams at the same time I did. So how did you prepare for the qualifying exams in those courses while at the same time playing catch up, playing un or doing undergraduate analysis? So I, um, I, I suppose I did my qualifiers probably slightly slower than everyone else. So a lot of the people uh, in my year who are, were applied people, what they did is they took statistics and uh, methods of applied math. They took the, those two courses at the same time, uh, part one in the first semester, part two in the next semester. And so then most of the people uh, in applied math who, who took both those courses, they then took both qualifiers uh, in the following or, or the summer 
right after them. Mm -hmm. And so I had, because I was taking real analysis uh, at the same time as I was taking stats, I did not take methods. The other sequence course that most of the applied math people did take. And so I did my, I did my stats and then I took the qualifier for that. Uh, I, I passed at master the first time and then I, I ended up retaking for a PhD level. Uh, and so then, wait, so you retook the stats? I retook the stats one. Yeah. Okay. But, uh, so I, I took that stats one in the summer and then at the same time as everyone else, but I, I had just barely passed at master level. And so then, uh, cause I guess at that time or around that time I had figured out that I was intending to go for, uh, uh, a PhD or, or continue uh, with my graduate school. So I had then retaken it for to pass a PhD level. And I did that in uh, December then. When did you take, uh, you took the numerical PhD or the qualifying exam? Yes, I took. When did you take that? Uh, this summer it would have been. And that was the first time? Yeah. And then you passed PhD first time for that one? I got 100 even. Oh, you got 100? I got 100 on numerical oh, dang. qualifier. Did you, is that the record currently? Did you set the record? <laughs> I've been told it's very uncommon. Very uncommon for us? Does that must have felt really often. good when they told you that. It did feel good. How I, much did you study for that test? More than the previous two. <laughs> I took, so, because it was like, I took the, the stats one in summer 22, must have been. And then I took it, I took the stats again, I retook it in December 22, and then it would have been summer 23 then, okay. as I, I'm taking numerical. And so this is then my, my kind of third qualifier I'm taking now. And so I was a little bit more prepared uh, for kind of what a qualifier entails, kind of the, the study procedures and time commitment you need to uh, kind of prepare for that, that type of exam. Yeah. And so... Uh, having been more prepared for it, along with the fact that I I was in a uh, need to pass scenario, as I would call it. Um, how, how do you mean need to pass? Like if you didn't pass, they were gonna not let you be a PhD student? It was going yes. So I, would they yeah. get, but you would get your master's degree? Yes. And then if you, okay, so let's, hypothetical, let's say you got your master's degree and you didn't pass PhD level. Yeah. Uh, what was your next step after that? It, I don't know what they would have done to me. Um, Do you think they'd let you take it again, though? They would, I, I'm sure they'd let me take it again. Okay. Um, probably in the summer, though, not in December. Uh, mm -hmm. or, or, or I should say in December, not in the summer. Because um, that was for numerical. Uh, but, but basically, the situation I was in was that uh, I had completed all of the coursework required for my master's. The only, the only thing left for me to, the only box left to tick in order to complete my master's was to pass this qualifier at master level. And so then, in addition with that, the only thing I needed to do to move to a PhD student was to pass that exam at PhD level instead of at master level. Okay. And so I, for the, because I had like nothing left to do for my master, I'm, going to you you register in advance for the courses right so yeah. for the upcoming fall semester i pretty much registered as a phd student i registered for uh, a research course and i registered for a, a special topics course both of which are what's, what's phd a, level only what's a resource level course a, a research course yeah a research course what um, is that? it's basically just like a, a a reading course it's like a um is this the, something what, that your advisor creates for you so that you can sign up for it and get credit? Cause, yes. Because I thought that only happened after you did candidacy. And you haven't done candidacy. Apparently not then. Okay. Um, myself and another student were, were talking with an advisor, and we wanted uh, to kind of study some, some material with them and look at some kind of research options and what our... I don't know, I guess path would be moving forward to, to research. Yeah. Um, it's very kind of like unclear and vague a lot of the time <laughs> what yeah. you're doing or where you're going. Um, so we wanted, uh, myself and this other student, we wanted to talk with this advisor and kind of do this research course. And what happens is you, you kind of meet regularly, like you might meet once a week and um, maybe in person, maybe you have a, a remote call. Uh, and you, you can kind of just talk about some stuff. It's a, it's 
it's more informal than like a, a typical class setting. Um, mm -hmm. You yeah, you can kind of like the your advisor may say you know kind of like look into this or, or like read this paper, read this chapter, and then like next time we'll discuss it and then you can kind of talk about it like that. Okay. Yeah, I noticed that sometimes you and him and your friend that mm -hmm. also does research with him, uh, you guys will meet virtually mm -hmm. a lot of the times because he won't be here yes. necessarily. Like he, isn't he like in the Canary Islands or something right now where he was? Or am I completely wrong? Uh, I don't think he's there but he is uh, not here currently okay so then you guys just meet virtually yeah uh, to discuss you know what it is yeah because you, know, you your research is in the field of statistics yes okay so the other fields if you want to call it that are like the methods course you know I don't know what methods is not a very good yeah description of what people do in that class but it's very applied Meaning that methods you, of applied mathematics. methods of applied mathematics because you the guy that does research there I know that well okay I don't want to talk about him too much but there's that course that people do the research in and then there's the numerical analysis side of it which I know there's a guy in the department hopefully I'll get an interview with him he does his research in numerical analysis and part of what he does is image deblurring right. You take an image, it's blurry, and then they enhance, like on CSI, yeah. to make the picture better. <laughs> That's kind of what he's doing. He's yeah. a professional enhancer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's probability theory, which is the only applied math course that I took, and mm -hmm. you sat next to me in the class. Yeah. And as far as I know, no one is doing research up and down this hallway in probability. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that is? Um, or at least maybe not why is that, but why, what makes statistics and numerical so much more attractive, I think, than, than the other two? I think the thing with probability is it's, it's too much of a, a blend of the pure and applied. So it's hard for either a pure or an applied person to say, this is my specialty. I'll go into this because yeah. the thing with probability is this was a complete surprise to me is the this little thing called measure theory uh, <laughs> and Burrell measurable sets and, and Burrell and <laughs> LeVague and all these guys um, so as an applied person probability at an undergraduate level is very interesting and cool to me at a graduate level it was very difficult to take the course initially mm -hmm. and so um, Cause you... I, th I think for, for applied people in particular, it is very easy to kind of encounter this measure theory that is the kind of baseline fundamental, uh, I don't know, ground of probability, yeah. which is a, a, a pure math kind of thing. This measure theory is like pure math. And so as an applied person, when you kind of encounter that the first time, it is very easy to just kind of look the other way and see statistics over there and see numerical over there and prefer those options. Would as, you... a, as a pure person, I'm not sure why you wouldn't like probability. Well, per you can personally, it is one of my favorite classes I've yeah. taken here. But I can't really say if it's the fact that I just like the course or I just really, really, really like the instructor. The instructor, yeah. The instructor was the greatest. He's good. He was, like, I've pretty much been in school for 30 years now almost. Well, not 30 years. I'm not that old. <laughs> because I didn't come out of the womb doing measure theory, okay? Yeah. <laughs> it's just, but I've been in school pretty much my entire adult life. Mm -hmm. And I've had, you know, I don't really count, you know, elementary school teachers because, you know, whatever. Right, right, right. But high school undergrad call it you know graduate school like the master's level because yeah. i've been to a couple different units if you considered all of them i would probably put him in top three yeah would you put him in your top three yeah he i i've i've only been so i can't speak to kind of other universities or professors from uh, elsewhere but from here uh i the the professor of this probability course i i was very fond of him i i enjoyed his his class uh his teaching style. Um. I uh, never took any notes during his class because I, I'm not saying that I'm a non note taker. Like I, I refuse to take notes because sometimes you have to, but I would prefer not to. 
yeah. and just listen to the instructor because if I'm writing, I'm not listening. Mm -hmm. But other guys, and like, do you struggle with that? Do you find yourself not listening when you're writing, or can you multitask? Because I can't do both. So I find it to be there's there's kind of like two cases that happen. There's like so so like it's so like one one situation that I I find to happen is like sometimes you uh, your brain turns off and you just are only writing down what's on the board. Yeah. And so then you you hope you can read what you wrote later and then interpret it because currently you cannot. Your brain is off. Whether that be you're just too tired or you just don't care or, or whatever <laughs> it may be. So that, that that's one situation that happens sometimes. You're just writing things down and nothing's going in your brain. Uh, and so then another kind of situation that happens is it's uh, writing the thing down is what makes you understand it. Yeah. You may read it off the board and not understand it on the board, but then when you write it down, that's when the understanding actually happens. So that also happens uh, to me anyway. Sometimes that happens. Uh, sometimes writing something down makes it make more sense. Yeah, it, it, it kind of bites you in the butt in the end because if you don't take notes, mm -hmm. what I mean by that is if you don't take notes and you just sit there and listen and just absorb the information the lecturer is giving you, you walk out of the room, it's like, what did we just talk about? You yeah. forget about it, and what's going to be on the test. With him, though, the reason why I rank him so high is because he'd be like, all right, we're going to do martingales today. Mm -hmm. And I was like, all right, I don't know anything about martingales. And then he would just talk about it for half an hour. And then, like, one hour after class, I'd be sitting in my office and be like, oh, my God, I know what martingales are. It was like one of those few times where... Yeah. So that's how, like... When he spoke, you just listened. He was one of those people. If you just, when he speaks, you realize that yes, this is a person that's worth listening to. He, he, he does that as well. And I, I would add to it. He's very uh, personable. Like he keeps you engaged in the class. You know, whether that be joking or just what he's saying yeah. is itself interesting enough. Um, so of the, you took all four of the graduate applied math courses, right? I did not take methods. You did not take methods. Did not take it. Are you going to take it? No. I mean, I mean, not, what if the graduate unless advisor next turns semester. Your, yeah, what if he twists your arm? Because I want to talk to you about something that you guys, and by you guys I mean the applied math gang, mm -hmm. are going through right now is that yeah. you were told to sign up for real analysis, graduate level real analysis, and complex analysis. Uh, I was only told to sign up for complex. I know. Because I believe real analysis is. Well, some people it's like from off applied the semester. Okay, I know last semester there was a bunch of applied math people taking real. Okay, were, were you not there? I was not a part of okay, that. Okay, never mind then. Well, there were some people that I knew yeah. for a fact because that guy down the hall and then our friend upstairs. Okay. They they both applied math. They took real one last semester, but this semester is different. You guys ran into the issue that there were no special topics courses for you guys to sign up for, so that correct me where I make an error, that there was no s classes to, to sign up for this semester. This is an issue from last semester. There was nothing to sign up for yeah. now. And then you had a back and forth with the graduate student advisor, and he pulled some strings so that you guys could take complex analysis. Yeah, so something like that happened. Um, the last semester... When we're signing up for courses for for this semester, we're picking the courses to take this semester. We the options are not uh, particularly I don't know available. The, there is limited availability of what not not by student count, but just by course offering. What was available to take? Uh, what courses you can register for? Mm -hmm. And so um, each person was. Uh, has a, a slightly different scenario, but there were a number of us who are were kind of stats people who were essentially just out of stat courses to take or uh, out of preferable courses to take like there in was the some eyes of our advisor. Yeah, they were available, but your advisor didn't like them for whatever reason. Like yeah. they weren't. So, so our advisor, once you turn into a PhD student, your advisor no longer wants you to take 50 level courses. And so he very strongly advises you not to and will, I don't know, not let you 
I don't know if you I don't know what it would come down to if you if you tried to make something happen but it, it's essentially is like there are a number of these 50 level courses that are advised not to take and then that leaves 60 and 70 level courses but there's very little 60 or 70 courses offered and so then if you've already taken them or you have a schedule conflict with a different course you, you you're kind of just left with like nothing to sign up for yeah so that was the issue and then they moved the time for complex right, right? so that you guys could take it but then you guys brought forth the complaint I don't know if we should say complained, but the question arose that, hey, this is a pure course. We're done taking qualifiers. We've done all this stuff. Why do we have to take it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was the, that was a uh, prevailing sentiment and one that I can understand and get behind. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that was exactly my perspective, but it's definitely one I understand. Um, and I'll just kind of take this pr perspective for a second. It's like, as a, as an applied math person, uh, once you, if you're in a, a graduate program and you're trying to complete your PhD, once you have completed your qualifying exams, you are trying to take your candidacy exam. This this basically marks the the start of your your dissertation. Your, yeah. You're going to be working with some advisor and you're going to be working on the paper that you eventually publish and that marks your PhD. And so once you've completed these qualifiers, you don't really want to be taking classes anymore. Yeah, you kind of want to just work on research. Yeah, because it's one thing when we say special topics courses, we really mean stuff that would probably help you do research and there's a very light workload meaning that you're not taking tests or doing homework. Or mm -hmm. They may have some homework or one test at the end or whatever, but usually it's very relaxed. You know I, I, mean? I took a special topics last semester, for example. We had two take-home exams and maybe six homeworks. That was the course. Oh, really? Some of my special topics, we don't have to do anything. <laughs> well, I mean, we, even... we take one test at the end, you know. We, we had two take-home exams, like, it's a take home exam. Yeah, it's a you take home. You can get all the points, right? <laughs> yeah, so, but here's the issue though. The topic, the special topics courses tend to be more relevant to your research. They're lighter workload, but this complex is not relevant to your research directly. Exactly. And it's a qualifier course, which means there's a lot more work to be done and you have to play catch up in order to do well in the class. And if you're doing that, you're not doing research. That is exactly the thing. Um, so, how are you managing not dying in the complex course? and doing your research. He laughs at well, me because <laughs> he's secretly dying inside. I probably failed my complex exam yesterday. So yeah, he, they had a not big, managing. That was their first test was yesterday. <laughs> yeah. And um, he, he, he actually, you actually texted me the night before. I did. It was 1 a.m., yeah, right? It was 1 a.m. on Monday. <laughs> and you're like, hey, are you up? <laughs> and I'm like, like yes, actually. Yeah, like, yeah. And then you're like, Hey, can you come in at like noon tomorrow and help me yeah. study? And I was like, yeah, sure, why not? So, cause, cause I feel for you guys, and I wanted. I also just like it when people talk to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I came in and I was helping you, and then our friend came in. Yeah, so uh, I, I'll help. be okay. The course is structured that you can drop a lowest exam, um, but in terms of like, I guess kind of more specifically, what you asked is like, how how do you manage this kind of like course thing that it's like the setup of this like there's the special topics courses which are kind of like lighter and then the the sequence courses are are rigorous and kind of well defined to say because everyone who takes these courses it's 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 standardized to stay it's there's a, a high standard for the sequence courses and so taking now a pure math sequence course is it's definitely like it's definitely harder. You can definitely tell the the workload of it. Uh, you there's just more work than you would have in a, a different course. So would you say that the pure math track is more? Well, I don't want to say it, it's bad to compare the two, but what's your? But if we were if we were going to compare the two for a second, <laughs> would you say that pure math is harder than applied, or vice versa, or are they about the same? 
because you're getting to see both pure and applied right now, and I haven't really seen much of applied. Right. The only applied that I've seen was probability theory, and it was very pure in nature, so mm-hmm. I'm used to it. Um, which one is harder? That's a very you get uh, to define question. You get to define hard. Um. I mean, I, it's like apples and oranges. I don't know. It's, and then it, 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 I would say it also depends on the instructor of these courses. Yeah. Um, I don't know. If it was like gun to my head, I had to answer. I would say pure math is harder. Why, why, uh, why did you pick pure math? Based on no information <laughs> or very little yeah, thought. Yeah, from my perspective applied math uh i don't know it it applied math has more intuition i would say like that you can relate it back to the real world yeah for 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 me personally anyway it's i find applied math that you can kind of intuit more and it's it's like it's like if i'm if i'm working on some hard problem it's like i can i can visualize the problem i can kind of see I mean, I guess you could say some of these things about pure. Here's the thing, though. Like with the, here's my experience with probability theory because I took the measure theory sequence here, and when I took it here, I mean, I had seen measure theory before, but when I'm seeing it again here, and we're doing all these, you know, proving these theorems about like Chebyshev's inequality or Igorov's mm-hmm. theorem or blah 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 blah, you. Sometimes I felt like I was missing context for the reason why we were doing it. It felt unmotivated mm-hmm. when we were seeing mm-hmm. these results. And then you see the proof, and you're like, yeah, I get it. But it's not a, it, you don't really get like why it's important and why we're doing any of this. But in probability theory, when you, know, you reframe measure theory in the context of probability, mm-hmm. then all of those stuff that you look, all that stuff that you look at, like Chebyshev and Igorov, it kind of is like, oh, so this is why we did all that. Yeah. This is where it was born from, essentially. Yeah. So I think that's kind of why I think maybe the applied math courses are atta- maybe easier. The yeah. math behind it that goes into it's a different story, but at least you had context. Yeah, yeah, I definitely think the like it, it, this is especially true from my perspective. Is like to me, like math, I am interested in what the math can do for me. You know, if I can take this math and apply it to some useful result, that's more interesting to me than some math that has no application (laughs) or at least no apparent or no apparent yeah (laughs) maybe it's useful to someone (laughs) yeah and the like the the so the kind of the way i think about like pure versus applied as well as it's like applied math is like you kind of you can see the problem you can you know kind of what you want your solution to be and then you can kind of work towards it with with pure math is like my understanding and the way I see it is you just kind of start messing around with some stuff and then all of a sudden you have a result and you're like, oh, this is useful way over there in yeah. some random place. And then that's the application of the, the pure result, whereas the applied kind of result and problem is, is like more of a straight line. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh I don't know. Maybe if I had to do it over again, I would play with more... Apply- I do want to play with more applied math courses. Like, I wanted to take statistics, but I dropped it. Right. I may end up going back people and People just- had problem with the instructor. <laughs> <laughs> You're not alone. There were eight people in that class, and I think half of them dropped the second by the second week, and I was one of them. But here's the thing. I dropped, and then I went one more class day just because I wanted to round out the week. <laughs> and I think I could see it on his face. So he's like, oh, cool. oh they're, they're leaving. <laughs> yeah. We won't get into that. But I do want to uh, go back over my statistics because I only took one stats course as an undergrad, and it was elementary stats. Mm-hmm. And I pretty much forgot all of it. Mm-hmm. I mean, I can I remember Z tables. Yeah. There's something out there called Z tables where you can look up, like, and I know that if you have, what is it? A sample size of at least what is it, thirty thousand, or maybe it's like not 30. even thirty. Thirty? Okay, I was completely way off. I was off by a magnitude of ten thousand, like or, or one thousand. Central limit theorem. Is yeah, that something like that. Yeah. So if you have like a sample size of three hundred, that's basically good enough. Yeah. So that kind of thing I want to do more of because I think it goes hand in hand with probability. 
yeah. pretty well. And to have both of those on a resume, I think. Just would, some probability. Yeah, yeah, because here's the thing. We suffer more in pure math, mm -hmm. and then you guys get jobs when we're done. <laughs> yeah. There's this woman that's going to, I'm going to interview her in like a couple weeks. She got her PhD here. I don't know if you ever met her. Probably not. I'll tell you who it is afterwards. But she got her PhD here in pure math. And not only did she do pure math, she did ring theory, mm. which is a subfield of algebra. I had one of the algebra stru instructors here said that if you're going to get your PhD in math, you should do applied math because that's how you get a job. <laughs> yeah. Job doing math. And if you're going to do pure math, you do analysis. You don't do algebra. This is from an algebraist. Mm -hmm. So he was like trying, he was like warning me, he's like, don't do what I do. Mm -hmm. You are going to struggle to find employment. Right. I would venture to say that algebra, meaning like group theory, ring theory, field theory, all that stuff is probably the purest form of math, meaning the least applications. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what she did. She worked with him got her PhD, mm -hmm. did ring theory, and uh, and you know what she ended up, when she defended her dissertation, she got her PhD the first semester we were here, yeah. all 21. Okay. The next semester she got a job as an assistant professor in applied mathematics. Oh. Nothing to do with algebra. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, you get a you get the job teaching what you just learned, and then yeah. the cycle repeats. <laughs> the cycle repeats. I, I know someone else here that's looking for teaching jobs, and they're always like, we want applied math. And it's like, why don't you want to talk to us, the pure math yeah. people? Uh -huh. We know stuff, too. Yeah. We can do stuff. So I guess that kind of leads my to my next topic, is, is what do you want to do with your PhD? Why are you getting the PhD? What made you want to get a PhD in the first place? Because okay. you were just going to stop at master's. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I'll, I'll back you up a step, even, uh, to high school to or, or college to, to graduate school to master's so when I was uh, you know it's like everyone tells you, you go to college right you're, you're in college and so then um, my perspective at the time as an undergraduate was that I wanted to make a lot of money so I would, <laughs> I would complete my master's <laughs> that was that was the thought process it was like okay if I if it says Bachelor of Science, I make this much. If it says Master of Science, I make that much. Yeah. That was that was my thought process as an undergraduate. Yeah. And so then I start uh, grad school. Uh, you know, I'm taking some classes and stuff like this. And uh, it's throughout throughout my time uh, as a master student, uh, kind of as it's going on and on, I'm realizing more and more that I like the the math, I guess, for itself rather than the money I can make out of it. Okay. And so I'm still an applied guy. I'm still very interested in what the math can do for me, but I'm also more interested now in what uh, what, what I can do with math holistically uh, as opposed to just how much money can I make with this title. Yeah, yeah. And so... Uh, My friend... Sorry, keep going. Uh, and, so, and so, yeah, so... Going for the for, for PhD now then, trying to complete that, uh, is is kind of a, a more I don't know, expanded picture. And so I'll I'll add this too as well as the the point we made about kind of taking complex this unrelated pure math course. So my, my research is more in statistics, uh, in AI even, um, and so taking this course complex is not going to help me almost at all to in terms of completing and working on my research for statistics the fields are separate enough that it, there's almost no overlap it feels like and so it it kind of feels that way and this was why i kind of specified a little bit my slightly different perspective to a lot of the other stats guys when thinking about this complex course was that my perspective is I am interested in learning kind of the more material. I'm, I'm more interested. I, it's complex is not uninteresting to me. It's it's only due to the kind of uh, constraints I'm in of trying to complete a PhD program that makes me less interested in this course. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Okay. So. Time is an issue for us. Yes. 
because there are a couple people here that when I ask them, like, when did you start? How long did it take? Not even people to here, but there's a postdoc here. I want to interview him, too. I hope, you know, he may cancel. I'm not saying that, you know, he, he's going to flake on me. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is something may change. It's a couple weeks down the road when I interview him. But he told me that it took him, like, seven years to do Ph.D. From, from starting his, when? Uh, well, that was my question. Like, when do you count that? Like, do you count yeah. that as bad? But no, it was post-bachelor. Like, he got his college degree seven years later, Ph.D. Okay. I was like, oh, that seems kind of like a lot. Yeah, it's like 11 years of school. Yeah, so, but I've also noticed that some people here that I've talked to, that, you know, they seven, eight years. Mm-hmm. And whereas the, the woman that I mentioned earlier that did algebra, she only was here four years. Mm-hmm. So there's different people have different timelines. And it seems to me that some people here are getting more time to finish their PhDs than others. And then I've also heard rumors that... Most likely, me and you, we're going to get five years and then not a year more. Really? Maybe. That's a, Take that with a grain of salt. So my question is, because you started as masters, where are they measuring that from? Are they measuring it now? Because you just got uh, a full-time teaching. Well, okay, not full-time teaching, but an assistantship teaching mm-hmm. here uh, starting this year, this academic year, correct? Or were you here last year? I got one the year before as well. Oh, okay. La- pre- the when I started as a master student, I was only part time faculty, yeah. so I did not have an assistantship in my first year as a grad student. But then my second and third years, I have had an assistantship. Okay, so for you, they would probably start measuring it from last year. I think it's. I think this kind of affects the GTAs, not so much the part time people. Mm-hmm. So. Thinking about that, it's kind of scared me a little bit. I'll tell you who I heard this rumor from. <laughs> it's somewhat re- it's a somewhat reliable source. So I'm a little bit scared that uh, the clock is running out because I'm in my third year, and then at the end of this, you know, three years is done. Mm-hmm. What has been done? I get two more years, basically. Mm-hmm. But also sometimes I feel like they don't want you to go too fast. Mm-hmm. Take complex analysis. Exactly. Right? It's like, well, I'll do it, but how much time are you going to give me to do all this? Right. So I think it's something that we should probably mention more about they, um, managing time. Yeah, that, that's that's the thing, because um, the, the graduate advisor here, he is very much of the perspective that pure people should be taking applied courses and applied people should be taking pure courses. He wants all of us to expand our knowledge as much as possible and broaden our horizons. That is his perspective. And so then the the other kind of, uh, like, nail in this is it's like, you your grades must stay up. You need, <laughs> you, you cannot get C's or they will write you a very angry letter. And so the, if you, if you're kind of, you, you, you they expect you can, A's. Too. Yeah. The, yeah. You, will you get a letter if you get a B? No, I don't think so. Okay. So they, but C. if you get like a lot of B's, will they look at you like, Hey, what are you doing? Maybe. I'm oh, really? not certain. Pretty much um, everyone here has to be a straight-A student. I, here. I just know they get very angry if you get a C. <laughs> I have gotten one C in stat, and then... What did they do to you? They, they write you an email. They say, <laughs> don't do this ever again, or or you're in big trouble, and oh, goodbye. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's, it's, it's extremely threatening, the, the tone of the email you get. Um, I remember when I was getting my master's degree, they they expected A's from the graduate students. Yeah. I think if you got a B, even, they were just like, "Hey, what gives? Why why did you get a B for? You know, right. you you can't really. It is kind of wild to see some of the students that we teach and just how they're like. He's like, you didn't do a single homework assignment the whole semester, and they're like, yeah, I don't really care. I'll take the class again. Yeah. I was like, you're gonna waste another year of your life, or not a year, but. Another semester of your life and take it. He goes, yeah, I don't care. Yeah. I say, All right, well, if, if, yeah. do, do you do you, I guess. But yeah. That's the, not really an option at this point. Yeah. The Different people are on different tracks in their life. They may or may not know where they're going. Yeah. Um, and, the, like, the thing, too, with, like, the uh, taking these other courses is, like, the, the, the grade is, like, it's a risk, you know, because it's like, okay... I can take 
the the safe applied math course i can take a numerical variant for like you know i took numerical one and two that's a sequence and then i took a variant a different numerical course and now i'm taking my fourth numerical course this semester and so that one course would satisfy my one mandatory 70 level course so i don't necessarily need to take complex but i am doing so and it's somewhat of a risk to me because it's much more likely to do worse in that more difficult sequence course in a in pure as opposed to apply and so it's like if i get a, a c in this course i'm gonna get another angry email and now i'll be two for two and that, you'll get a letter in your file <laughs> and it'll be bad so you know i already went and failed exam one ah uh, you probably did better than you thought the one of, unless you're absolutely there's seven questions one of them is blank I'll tell oh. you that. I left one. I left one of the questions on my qualifier blank that I ended up yeah. passing. So, hey, well, so it could work out in your. Well, favor. a pass on the qualifier is seventy. That is true, but I mean, <laughs> look, <laughs> like I know, I know, I didn't do good. All okay. right, there's no way around it. I, there's probably there's probably three questions that I got most of the credit or all of it on, and yeah. then four of them are between zero to fifty percent credit. <laughs> so let's talk about. Um, preparing for tests and studying and mm -hmm. all that good stuff because uh well i mean we're running up on 42 minutes now so um what do you attribute to success in college and graduate school in particular like what is the thing that when you look at like i got an a here i got an a here i'm doing research i'm doing all of these things that you know a lot of college students will okay so let me back up a little bit i, I think my question is more or less obvious but some college students are hesitant about graduate school because college by itself, when they enter it for the first time, is extremely overwhelming mm -hmm. because you get unparalleled levels of independence. Because in high school, it's like, they like almost, I hate to say it, but they kind of treat you like a baby yeah. in some places. They treat you like, it's like, they're not a baby though. They're 17 years old. Yeah, I you know, ask they can drive. <laughs> and then you're like, okay, go to college. And you get to college and it's like, where is this hand holding that I was so accustomed to? Mm -hmm. And you know, some of us would argue that we still kind of handhold a little too much in college, but but by the end of the first year, that's kind of gone, I think. And then it's become then it's all independence. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe this is, at least that's kind of the way it was for me. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been out of high school maybe like ten years now or something like that. But that's what I remember. So my point is, is that they see how overwhelming college is. And then grad school is like that times 10. So the question is, I forgot. <laughs> I, I, think I, I think I know what you Do you mean remember at. what I'm getting you at? Said, you, said, you said like kind of, um, how, how do you study for tests and exams like this? And then also like, I don't know, how. They're worried that how do you because apply? of how bad college is, like how much time and effort and just how much responsibility you yeah. need to have to succeed in college how on earth can you actually do it in graduate school so what do you attribute to your success as a graduate student like keep going yeah. making it past the qualifiers doing the research how do you what what do you attribute to it so i mean no, no, number one i shout out my family they've been incredibly supportive of me um in some instances financially and in other instances just every way you can think of so I mean, and you, having having people around you to support you is always going to help uh, in any endeavor, uh, and whatever that support may look like may vary. So yeah. I would just preface with that. Um, but as opposed for more specifically about me and what I was doing and kind of how I went through it, the the like you you talk about this like you go from high school to college and it feels like a, a certain like jump in level. You have to kind of I don't know, exert more energy or more effort or, or try harder or something than you previously were doing. And so that kind of, that jump, it may, uh, it may be a large jump to make. And so you may have made that jump and then you look at the next jump to, to graduate school and you go, oh my God, it's so much farther. How am I gonna jump from, I'm, I'm already like so high up, how do I jump even higher? And so, the thing you have to kind of realize is you are now capable of jumping higher 
Yeah. Going like you 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 keep you're always kind of training and improving yourself in a way. It's like the 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 struggles and the the trials and the tribulations you go through uh, in your in any phase, they're going to hopefully improve you as a, a person, and you'll you'll learn from some of the mistakes you made and and things like this. And so then, using kind of that information, you've kind of hopefully you've you've leveled yourself up in some way. And so now this like ten x jump you have to make, it's a ten times farther jump. Maybe you can jump ten times as far as you previously could. It's also gradual too. It's like if you took eighteen year old Rob Sylvie and mm-hmm. put him in graduate school, do you think that he would run or do you think he could do it? And me personally, if you took eighteen year old me and put me in graduate school, I'd be like, Dad, I can't do this. <laughs> I am dying My- here. <laughs> but the thing is though, like in college, like you know, I was kind of used to working a lot because I was a good student in mm-hmm. school because that was all hard work. Mm-hmm. You didn't really have to be smart. Yeah. Sad to say, you didn't really have to be a smart kid mm-hmm. in order to get good grades in high school. It was all hard work. But when you get to college and it's like, okay, you think you're good at math? Here, try this. And you look at it, you're like, okay, I wasn't really that good at math. I yeah. like <laughs> But then at that point, it's just like, okay, you thought you were working hard before. Get This is, this is real hard work. Yeah. And then you just do it. And then eventually, you know, by the time you get to grad school, you're like I mentioned that, that joke the other day about that dog that sits in the room and everything's on fire. Yeah, this goes, is this, fine. This is fine. That's exactly how it is. Yeah. You're throughout and it's that's that's not grad school, that's life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I I would agree with that. Um you whatever you you kind of whatever seems like daunting or challenging to you previously may not be anymore and so yeah. the next daunting and challenging thing you you have to kind of look back and say like I, I did this thing now I can do that thing I can do the next and I think I asked you this earlier because I am watching the time now but what did you say that you wanted to do after getting the PhD what kind of job academia or private sector uh, I would like to do research in the private sector uh, but I'm increasingly skeptical of that and unsure what my future may hold. So I I know I, I you do... have a pretty active interest in AI and yes. Chat GPT. Yes. So tell me every here's the thing. I don't know nothing. Okay. <laughs> and I mean I don't know nothing about Chat GPT. Yeah. <laughs> I know that you can type in a question and sometimes it will lie to you and sometimes it'll get you an answer. That's this what is I true. know. So this tell happens. me, so tell, I'm an idiot. Tell me about ChatGPT and this AI business. Um, okay, so you can think of, uh, you can think of ChatGPT much like the, the general internet that you have. So like when you go to Google and you Google something, uh, you shouldn't trust instantaneously everything you see. Yeah. So it's, it's the same thing with ChatGPT. You can think of ChatGPT as it, it basically it studied everything on the internet at a certain point in time and then it has kind of uh, some space of knowledge that it, it knows about and it can draw from and so what it's drawing from the information may not be correct you there may be someone on the internet writes 2 plus 2 equals 5 and chat GPT has read this information and learned it then that's how it'll give you back the kind of incorrect information. And so uh, people say sometimes it's it hallucinates as well. Um, that's where it just makes up something, right? It just makes something up. It's like, where did that come from? It's like... Okay, what happens when you... Because when I asked... Well, me and you were playing with chat GPT, and I just asked it to prove a theorem from real life. I said, prove the bolzano weierstrass theorem. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I did that. But you can also give it prompts like... Write me a short story about Spider Man. Yeah, and it can do it. Mm-hmm. What is? It's much better at that than proving it's, theorems. It's better at just making up crap rather than proving it stuff is, that's known. It is a uh, a large language model is essentially uh, predicting the most likely next word. So it's like you ask it to write. Is that this... like when you're text messaging and they have? Yeah, it's like oh, autocomplete. Okay, it's, oh. it's basically like that. That's a good uh, example. Um, oh, you're. Uh, it's like okay write me a short story on spider-man or something it's like it based on what it's learned from the english language it might use some kind of like these filler words and it's it 
it's basically just looking at every next word. What is the most likely word that will be next? It's like, what what do you say next? It's like on what your are phone, some, you autocomplete. Exactly. What are some reservations do you have about ChatGPT and AI? Because some people are scared of it. Are you scared of it? I am scared of government and the improper regulations that may or may not happen. With like around like, AI in general. Yeah. So I say chat GPT, but what, what, what should I be calling it in general, this, this technology? Well, I mean, AI is a very, um, just a vast space of technology. Okay. It can, it can be used for, for text generation. It can be used for image generation, video generation. Now we're seeing there, there's time, a new release by open AI. I believe Sora is called. It makes videos. I don't know. It just, well, I just know that every time I get on social media, it's AI generated art. Yep. And some other things that are unsavory, but it's like, it's like the only thing I see now. So do you think that this is going to replace, like, are we all just going to be out of a job <laughs> with AI? Uh, the, the thing with AI is the, it's very particular what question you ask and on what time frame, because the, the potential of AI is very, very large. You know, the, the space with which it could do things, could, is, is immense. But it's a matter of kind of, in, in my perspective, it's, it's entirely just a matter of what time frame you ask the question on. Okay. So it's like if you say, okay, is AI going to take all of our jobs in five years? It's like, okay, probably not. You know, it's, it's going to be taking more, but it's not going to take all of them. Is it going to take it in 10 years, in 20 years? It's like, well, I, it's the, the improvements that are made to AI may come in very significant leaps at unexpected times. Okay. So it, to, to me, it's, it's, it's all just a question of when. Because it's like, if we, if we, we change this now, it's like 100 years from now, it's like, it's going to be completely different. Yeah. Do you think that um, the mathematicians are safe? Because you said it's good at making up stories about Spider-Man, but not so yeah. much proven Bolzano virus trials. So the chat GPT in specific is good at like stories and lists and, yeah. and writing words. Um, in terms of doing like proofs and theorems and stuff, I'm very uh, excited and interested by the potential that is there. So. Uh, you've probably heard of like Stephen Wolfram and Mathematica. Yeah, yeah. The he uh, is he has a, a Chat GPT plugin that allows Chat GPT to interface with Mathematica. Okay. And so it it can in in sometimes do proofs like like it using this. It it can it, it can, prove like can it prove like novel things like open problems? Can it do anything like that? I don't, Probably not. I don't think it's quite there yet, but the. Do you think it'll get there? I think I think it is, getting there. Um, it's very, it's it's a very uh, interesting application from my perspective. The that of, uh, both of, uh, teaching and learning from a student, but also from the like the advanced level, the research, the proofs. Um, I think there's. In, in the future, there's going to be a lot of uh, strong use case and application in, in this uh, kind of domain because it's the, the exact kind of problem holding, holding back right now is that the, the hallucinations, the, the false information, as you yeah. say. So it's, it's, it's not reliable. It's, it's kind of just reliable enough that you can get useful results as long as it's not like super important, <laughs> absolutely must be correct. It needs a babysitter. In a yeah. Sense. You, you, yeah, you can't exactly. just let it run wild. So in the Some future, people... as, as, this, uh, as these tools get more robust and reliable, and you know, if, if ChatGPT can plug into Wolfram Alfram, this Mathematica, this massive computer source, and can do these computations in, in kind of symbolic math language, the way you would do it with your hand on a piece of paper. Um, if it's capable of doing these types of things, then I think it'll it'll have massive uh, kind of findings or results. But it, it's, it's as I say, it's a question of when kind of when is it reliable enough to trust, or when is it more accurate than uh, 
competent human in appropriate field. Well, let's let's wrap up here. Let me ask some some quick questions and then sure. and then uh, let's do like rapid fire questions. Okay. Teaching. What do you think of it? You like it? Yeah. Yeah, I like teaching a lot. I do not want to be a career teacher, but I do enjoy teaching. That's good. That's good. What do you do to decompress? Spend time with family, friends, listen to music, play video games. What do you do? Yeah, I mean, I play video games. I go to the gym. I mean, I mean, yeah, I like hang out with my friends. <laughs> do you ever find that it interferes with math life, grad school life, or are you pretty good at allocating time for everything? I mean, you try, but no, <laughs> grad school takes over your life. <laughs> it takes over your life. I you think that's you true. do the best you can to kind of. It's like, it's very, it's very, like, depending on your, your particular uh, habits or hobbies, if you have good ones and you can kind of get on top of them to say, if you're on top of the ball, it almost makes it easier to do your grad school. But if you are not in that situation or you stumble for a second, everything just like falls in on itself and you're, yeah. and you fail your complex exam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean... Yeah, <laughs> I know how you feel. I know, I know. Um, so let me ask you, what did I want to ask you, actually? Let me think. So I ask a lot of people about imposter syndrome, but I, I feel like you don't really, I don't get that from you, like that vibe, if you want to say. You seem to like, this is the job, this is what I'm going to do. You never really seem to like stop and ask yourself, do I belong here? It's just more like, this is the job, this is what I do. Or am I completely wrong? Uh, do you ever feel like this is overwhelming, you shouldn't be here? I, I would say I struggled with imposter syndrome much more in my college, like my regular level, my undergrad. Okay. Um, but not so much anymore? Yeah. I, I, it's, in, in high school, my ego was ginormous there was no thought of imposter syndrome uh, <laughs> really you thought you were the master of uh, yeah 17 <laughs> i own the world yeah um, i i to so be honest i think i was also in that i, I, st I started there and then kind of more towards college you know i, I kind of toned down a little bit and yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you get a little bit of a kind of the imposter syndrome you get a reality check yeah um and then maybe maybe even i'd say in my first couple of semesters as a grad student i would say i maybe also had some um I think I think a lot of us get humbled. Like I asked, yeah. him, like, did you get humbled? He's like, oh yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> definitely, absolutely. Okay, uh, this is should, this should be the last question. This has been way longer than what we originally no. thought, but it's okay. It's okay. It can be as no long problem. as we want. Uh, what's your favorite number and why? Uh, three why? because it's <laughs> been uh, my, I, Sushant's favorite number is three. <laughs> it's been my I don't know. I, it's been my favorite number as long as I can remember. Do you have? Do you know where it came from? It's I, just always been three. As as long as I can remember, it has been three. It's the, it's not been like I didn't have one. Like it's been three since I can remember having one. Really? Wait, like I don't I don't know why. It's I, it's like it's odd. It's like yeah. it's like a like a low like solid number, but it's like not like one or two. Not like prime. What well, is it? The fact that it's prime does that, that have doesn't any? Mean anything. That doesn't mean. I, anything. I was my favorite number before I knew what prime numbers were. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. I say all this, but it's not like. <laughs> it's, it's not like I I super love three more than other numbers. It's just it's like a it's like a light favorite, but it's been that way for a long time. Okay. Okay. It's not like I particularly. I know. So when I ask yeah. this question, is like everyone picks a positive integer. Hmm. Like, no one picks a fraction. No one picks a negative number. No one says, like, pi or e or anything like that or i. Negative 112. Yeah, negative 112, <laughs> also known as infinity. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, so it's interesting. So, so are, one, yeah. 1 over 137. It's one like over, physics or something. That one's from physics? I don't know. You're talking to pure math. I don't know anything about real-world problems here. I might be wrong on that one. I don't know what that is. Okay, so do you have any questions for me before we... Call questions for you. Yeah. Make them good. Make them make them mean. Questions for you. Um what well, I don't know. I guess like what the this very likely would not happen. Would you retake stats if that one professor who taught probability taught it? 
Uh, if the workload was light, then sure. Otherwise, no. Well, I mean, I feel like I'm at the point now where I can just learn something on my own. Right. I don't really, I mean, no disrespect to lecturers, but I feel like I can teach myself better. <laughs> like, I like just tell me what book is good. Give me the book. I will read the book. I will write down the theorems. I will write down their proofs. I will analyze them. I may throw in some exercises or just go to Stack Exchange and figure it out. But I'm much more comfortable doing that now than I was, like, say, 10 years ago, which... I was completely dependent upon lecturers and did not like reading at all. But now I'm so so used to being independent mm -hmm. because you have to be in order to study for that stupid qual. Yeah. I shouldn't call it stupid, but I mean... No, you can. It, well, I mean, it's just like it beats you to death, and then you're just like, stupid qual. And then, yeah. <laughs> so, so I would... If the lecturer had, like, good stellar reviews, then yeah, sure. But uh, if uh, the lecturer is just going to make me do a bunch of work that's going to interfere with my research then no i'll just read a book yeah so but yeah i do want more stats because i feel like it will help me get a job you know with a stats You're a youtuber probably. yeah i'm a youtuber but i mean i didn't ever get apply this job and i i use you we use the you word youtuber loosely here <laughs> because i i'm not like <laughs> rolling in money here <laughs> okay robbie it was good talking to you thank you very much for interviewing like yeah. Interview you. yeah, thank you for uh, having me, I guess. I don't know. It was, Any I, it was fun. It was fun. Any concluding remarks? or No. Uh, we no. pretty much we said goodbye like three Good times luck. so far. Good luck. <laughs> Thanks for listening.